the pandemic's really humanized everybody's roles. It's definitely brought a lot more grace to the practice of teaching and, and learning. We can't go to school anymore and you miss your friends and hanging out in the hallways, talk to them. What if this happens again? My goal is that no matter what, class can still take place. We'll never go back to the way it was, and honestly, I don't think we should. I think that the way that we've used technology this year should always be used now and moving forward, and then even more moving forward. Looking back to face what is ahead, district strategies to engage with English learner students, students with disabilities, and their families is produced in collaboration with WTTW and the Regional Educational Laboratory Midwest, putting research into action. Funding is provided by the Institute of Education Sciences. So if you think of family engagement very broadly, not just attending PTO meetings or going to teacher conferences, but really um, becoming part of the school community. They've shown that family engagement has really helped student achievement in a variety of ways. It helps the child stay motivated at school. Suddenly the parents know more of what the student expectations are, what's expected of their kids, so they can help them at home meet those school requirements. They feel part of the community. They feel welcomed. So in our study of how districts responded to COVID, we saw that districts have really used a number of innovative strategies. They have used video calls to communicate with families, um, phone calls, emails, um, social media has been another really big um, aspect that districts have used. Districts even went to students' homes. So they did porch teaching, sent materials home uh, to make sure that families were engaged and felt prepared to support their students. We're a relatively small district. Uh, we're just under a thousand students. We're um, about 60% African-American and about 20 some percent uh, Latino students. This is a working class community. So parents are always at work. There's a lot of grandparents who are raising children. The parent involvement was Minimal. I've always strived to do this to keep parents involved in a regular school year. I think the pandemic made it even more challenging but also more necessary. My oldest son has an IEP that's an individual educational learning plan. He did not like school at all, so he learns slower than most children. It was difficult at first. The good part was that he already liked computers. He liked to be on YouTube, so he knew how to navigate to a point. Getting him motivated just to want to get online for school was tough until he got to know his teacher. I was failing, but when, I, but when they started helping me, I got better. Curtis is one of my students that is so happy now about school. I always thought lecturing and uh, kind of modeling things were helping the kids. But when it became remote, it was a little bit difficult to actually lecture to a student that, that was on the screen and keep it where the student wasn't bored. This is an odd way of for a lot of us to be interacting on a daily basis. Um, disengagement is high, truancy uh, is high. Um, so we need to think of ways to make sure students stay engaged. Go ahead, Curtis, one more time. With the games and different things that I incorporated, they got excited. I like solving the problems. And when I just know it, I, I go for it. If you come from my classroom, you'll think we're having a party. So I use Kahoot. I use different games like quizzes. Even when my children thought they were playing, they were really learning. And that really helped carry them through the school year. Parent and student engagement before the pandemic was different because usually I didn't talk to parents as much. The only time I talked to a parent was during parent-teacher conference. How can I help my child stay on target? How can I help them not be bored while they're online or drift off? If I'm not calling them on the phone, 
uh, I might send them a, uh, a text message. Uh, I also use an app, which many teachers do, called Remind, to um, communicate directly with parents. Knowing that I could interject at some point during instruction and just say, hey, Ms. Turner, I have a question. Can we talk after class? Or, Ms. Turner, I sent you an email. Can you respond to me? It helped strengthen how my kids learned, and then it helped the, the teachers know how to really respond. One thing I also like is the constant communication with his teacher. If there was something going wrong or something going right, if Curtis did excellent all week, I knew I can count on Ms. Turner to call me and say, hey mom, I just wanted you to know Curtis is doing well. He got a good grade on this test, he got a good grade on that test, but I would like for you to look out for this or I would like for you to look out for that and I really, really appreciated that. For English learner families in particular, there's typically a mismatch when the family comes and enters the U.S. Uh, education system. They're not sure of the expectations. They're not sure how to guide their child. So if a school finds a way to engage a family from a different culture, this in fact has incredible positive outcomes for both the family and the child. On the family side, they feel part of a community. Even though they're really far away from their native country, they feel that they have people they can turn to if they need something, as well as the child feels welcomed. Their culture is considered an asset. We know through research that families provide a wealth of knowledge, especially um, culturally and linguistically diverse families. They come with unique backgrounds and experiences that schools really can leverage to better understand and engage with their families and better support students. Schools definitely want to do that. I think, um, unfortunately, we may not always uh, have the capacity to, to do the outreach, the level of engagement that really is needed to make sure that students and parents and families are on the same page and that families feel empowered to really advocate for their child. Cicero was one of the highest COVID rates out of any Cook County suburb and seeing it. And even uh, past students and graduates were reaching out to Morton because they knew we would be here. We were here to help. As a school district, you know, we're, we're somewhat under-resourced. Uh, we're the fourth least adequately funded school district in the state of Illinois. From a resource standpoint, we are very creative and very innovative about maximizing everything that we have in order to support our kids to be successful. It's not exactly, you know, what's wrong with them, but what is happening to them uh, because they're the, they can be the most vulnerable at this moment. If they're not attending class, I would stray away from saying like, you know, they're not trying. If it's being more culturally responsive, supporting them, how can we adapt to them and their needs? They have a second job, if they're helping the family out at home. It's first, we have to understand like their needs at the moment. Parents seem more willing to hear you out as a teacher. I think because on both ends, we know there's a struggle right now with being a parent during the pandemic, and it's a similar struggle with being a teacher. So I think there's like an unspoken respect that is, I know you're struggling as much as I am. How can I help you with my child? Casi nunca hubo ninguna comunicación. Ahora con la pandemia hubo mucha comunicación. Sabe uno, se enreda uno más en el tema. Está uno en el tema del alumno. Está uno con ellos. Siempre, nunca, no es lo mismo. Siempre hubo más interacción con los maestros. Siempre nos dimos cuenta, nos dimos cuenta el, el tema que estaban y siempre Ahora en la pandemia fue lo mejor que me pudo haber pasado a mí porque me di cuenta de hasta de conocer la voz de los maestros y todo. Cómo hablaban y cómo eh, hablan ellos, cómo se expresan de María Camila, cómo decía las cosas, porque en la casa pues son unos y en la escuela son otros y decía, no, pues Camila siempre sobresalía en eso. Sobresalió muchísimo ahorita en la pandemia, le fue muy bien. I've been sending home connection letters of every unit, and on the connection letter there's a QR code. The parents are scanning the QR codes and can see what's uploaded now, which is just, things are more accessible now. Parents are seeing what's going on in the class. Es más fácil, en lo personal, estar desde mi casa, en frente de la computadora, porque me enfoco simplemente en eso. Desafortunadamente, por la pandemia, 
ahora le va muy bien. O sea, no tengo queja. Creo que le iba mejor, le va mejor ahora en la pandemia que en la escuela. Cuando estaba en Freshman, que era todo divertido, podía convivir mucho con mis compañeros y con mis maestros. Me sentía cómoda y era más fácil aprender. Pero por otra parte, a mí me sirvió mucho um, las clases por la computadora, ya que soy una persona algo distraída, entonces so, simplemente me enfoco en la computadora y eso me ayudó demasiado. Pero para el próximo año espero que todo sea como 2019, ¿verdad? Ay, no, todo era funny, todo era bonito y divertido. So, traditionally, before the pandemic, student engagement was very much in the classroom with the activities that we did, and family engagement was, you know, parent-teacher conferences, getting parents involved. Post-pandemic, it's a lot of communication apps, so Google Voice, I find myself making text messages, and what I've liked about that, and I think we're going to continue it post-pandemic, is I can send a text to a parent and they can reply at their earliest convenience. So sometimes I'm at home making dinner and I get that quick text reply, which I know is a bit unorthodox, but it, it gives more flexibility to parents and to myself, really, because I know not everybody has this, this um, nine to five schedule. One of the most uh, common and most successful ways to communicate with families today, busy ones, are text messaging. No one would have thought, only as a researcher, I would have never thought that text messaging would be the number one way to uh, connect with people, but it's been a really successful way on the go for parents to know what's going on and um, also just be informed and feel responsive. They can be responsive to the school quickly through text messaging. Um, for example, uh, some schools do these automatic text, text now to tell you if anything changes in the schedule, what needs to be done. And now teachers have that kind of group text for their class as well. Family engagement was definitely uh, number one priority for schools and really uh, not just communicating about students' academic needs, but uh, really that was kind of their first line of, of communication to help families with just their basic needs during this time. So just basic, um, taking care of basic, uh, you know, physical and social emotional needs, and then uh, building their relationship as kind of the second priority, and then worrying about academics uh, kind of last. So I think, uh, the shift in priorities was something that we really saw uh, through the pandemic was that districts really prioritized making sure that families were um, safe and taken care of uh, and then building that relationship first and foremost. Coffee with the principal we hold monthly. I update our families on our school data, let everybody know what's going on for the month, thank them for coming in and getting involved and we try to get them to go see a counselor after they're done with the meeting, go see a teacher, like whatever they need, just come into the building, right? And get used to the resources and the things that we have available here. We went virtual. Instead of our usual 60 to 70 parents that would come for these monthly sessions, we were hitting a wider audience. So a lot of guests this year on Coffee with the Principal included community agencies. How can we help you support your, your students at home with um, either counseling, social workers, Equity is something that rose to the top as a result of our research as a district's number one concern. All districts said that they really struggled to make sure that families were served in an equitable way. They were very aware and concerned about the families that they were not able to reach easily. So families that maybe had difficulty with internet access or that maybe did not have laptops or Chromebooks we found in our study really were able to prioritize them and bring them to the top and make sure that their number one goal was that all students had the tools and resources that they need. Students with disabilities have had an opportunity to make appointments and come into school prior to when we returned in person. For my special needs students, it's parent relationships. That was important. Parent let the parents know that their child was valued and wanted and was an important part of that classroom structure. Um, so sort of getting their buy-in and their participation or cooperation has really helped a lot. Mm, my favorite subject is science. I'm not a good reader. 
but I try. I want to be a doctor when I'm good because my family doesn't really have a doctor and that's been my dream to be one. Bailey is awesome. I think with it being just the two of us in person, I've gotten super attached to her and she's super spoiled with me. <laughs> we, she talks to me all day long. <laughs> my parents really don't know what to do not put you. Tener más relaciones con la maestra, porque a veces cuando los chamacos vienen a la escuela, al aula, viene de uno, no más viene a dejarlo y se va. Pero ya cuando estás hablando con ellas por teléfono, ya es diferente porque ya tienes más relación social con ellos, ya conoces los maestros, conoces las personas que están en la escuela, a veces. Once the pandemic hit, there was far more interaction because everyone was so out of the loop as to what to do, how to do it. Sometimes, well past school hours, uh, whenever I just kind of had an open link for them if they needed to, and it would come on and I would know that, okay, somebody having a question or a concern about something. Just to kind of help them navigate the uncertainty of how do we do this school outside of school. Do you have everything? We want to make sure that for students with disabilities, uh, we're as consistent as possible. So making sure that they have consistent practice of the skills that they're learning, that they're using the same materials in the same way that they did in school, um, that they have a, a structured routine and concrete um, expectations. All of those are, are uh, really, really critical for our students with disabilities and making sure that they're able to practice new skills and that they're able to, uh, to continue and, and maintain the mastery of those skills. Looking at our school data, we were looking at our grades and seeing like who are the students that need the most support. When our schools were able to reopen, when the Illinois Department of Health said, yeah, we could start having students in school, uh, we were very targeted. We wanted to have and focus uh, our services on our special ed students, our, our students with special needs, and um, our EL students, those students that need support. For learning online, it's like really hard. But especially students with severe and profound disabilities, having them being busy and somewhere where they can go every day is one of the most important things, as much so as anything that's happening during the course of that day, because it's just the product of routine and the meaningful, the meaning in the day, the meaning in the week. There's a daily living skills checklist that they were working on every day. I always wanted to drop out of school, but I'm like, no, just keep going because I want to be something. Communication became so much more regular with parents. There was, I would say, much more frequent emailing, et cetera, between parents and teachers. It took a little while, you know, for me to learn how to do it with the computer and stuff like that, but we did it, we worked it out, and that's how we all, we communicate, I communicated with these teachers. It's hard for me because you hear like other kids on the headphones and all that, and it's echoing, and it's like really bad, and it's feel like my laptop like glitching or like not working at all, so I like doing it in person instead, so I could understand more. I've had three or four parents now who've called with all the reasons they didn't want to send their son or daughter back, and I just said, well, here's where we're at. And all of those parents have since said, this makes a world of difference because they're on site. Really helping bridge that home to school connection because some of our families believe that school is school, and when you come home, you know, it's, it's, it's not this whole like wrap around. There's not a connection between it all. Just getting to know the students and making them feel relevant here, making them feel important because there's something to be said about a school that celebrates their students' culture because the students feel like they belong. The school is for like your family because it's help you and keep your mind focused and keep like work hard because we're at the school, it's not, it's like, they help me look for a job and want to be something in life. And I help my son, you know, where he's at right now. Now he has a job, you know, and he's really happy. That's what makes it feel like a second home. And, you know, it opens up to a lot more learning that can be, can be had there. High school, for a lot of our community, first generation immigrants, sometimes this is the first high school diploma in the household. High school is celebrated. I mean, it's a great celebration for a lot of our community members here. 
finding a way to celebrate graduation in our seniors last year was probably some of the some of the highlights of, of the pandemic from last year. It's the low stage and they have 2020 big numbers and our principal cowboy caught out of him and we took a picture of we cross the stage and shake, shake their hands and go. Even though going through the whole pandemic and everything going on, it just gave us still light to look forward that it's, hope. it's yes, hope, right? The hope that we were, that he's doing it. He's, you know, all the principals and all of them, at least they did something for them. And we were all sitting in our cars across the street. We would clap and see him so proud. And he was, they were so happy. My son was very, I was so happy and proud of my son. It's so difficult navigating from the computer screen to the students in person, back to the computer screen, and making sure that I'm giving everybody my time. The biggest thing that I'm doing this year is I've recorded myself teaching, and it has done such an amazing job with helping my students understand. Because if we're in class, even if they were in person, if we're in class, sometimes when they go home, they forget everything that's been taught. So I would use interactive notebooks and things like that to help them. But now I record myself teaching. And so they can see my notebook, they can see the examples, they hear my voice explaining everything step by step, and then they can watch it again and again and again, as many times as they need to at whatever time. They're not limited anymore. And I was a resistor back in the fall. I was not one to be easily moved to online platforms for learning, but I found that it engaged the students and it helped the students with their comprehension and their success in the classroom. And because of that, I will continue to do more of that when we return to full in-person learning. The flexibility that the pandemic allowed the profession um, in a lot of ways, I would like to see that continue. The transparency of what's going on in the classroom, that would be great to see continue. And also for parents, I know for English learners, many parents often did not feel comfortable asking too many questions of the school previous to the pandemic. But because of the situation, they found themselves asking many more questions, contacting the school more. I'd like to see that continue. There's no harm in more communication and transparency. There are a number of principles of effective partnerships that really influence families' perception and engagement with education. So for example, communicating with families in a respectful way, taking into account families' cultural diversity and linguistic background has been really effective in making sure that parents have access to um, supports at school and that they feel empowered and informed um, and able to advocate for their student. We also see that using cultural navigators has been a really good strategy that research has shown has been a way to promote respect and communication. So using folks like parent liaison or community members has really provided a way that parents can uh, communicate with schools and feel that they're able to gain trust and have a really trustworthy relationship and advocate for their, their student outcomes. Going forward, whether it's more virtual options for parents to be engaged with school or more virtual options for students as well, how do we make uh, personnel who support the students available in a virtual way. Be a good listener and be open to whatever your, your community is, is asking of you. Because a lot of times policy comes from the top and very little feedback. But I think more than ever it's, it's important to listen to your community. I think we were able to adjust and mobilize and, and provide our community with a lot. These teachers do so many more things with the students than just get up there and teach a lesson, right? They're people, they're relationships, and I feel that they still try to connect, and the technology just needed to be there for them to be able to do that. Everybody has suffered in some kind of way. Everybody has, we're human and we're emotional, and children don't have control over their emotions completely. And to keep that in mind as we're going over rules and procedures and policies to be able to know that we have feelings, we have emotions, and the children do as well. And they may not be able to get right back into the swing of things the way that it used to be right away.
even though we're reopening and we're getting back to normal, a lot of people's lives have drastically changed. I mean, we've had students who have, have lost family members. We have parents who have lost jobs, who have lost stable forms of income, right? Everything's changed even though we're back to normal. And just because we're back to normal, I don't think that we should get rid of our, our practices. The learning outcomes don't change, but but the grace that we give our students does. Beyond the pandemic, I want to see that grace be extended. This program was produced in collaboration with WTTW and the Regional Educational Laboratory Midwest, putting research into action. Funding has been provided by the Institute of Education Sciences.